السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي The Hijra to Abyssinia How many Muslims migrated to Habasha in the first hijra about 15 or 17 what happened after that the muslims returned to makkah why did they return because they heard a rumor that the quraysh had become muslim so what happened then when they returned to makkah and they found out that that was a rumor that was not true what happened after that yes and then what happened this led to the second hijra to abyssinia how many muslims went for the second hijra 80 of them right 80 muslims men and women many families they went to habasha and in habasha what did they do what did they do in habasha yes okay what we see is that the muslims basically in habasha they they lived in peace they practiced their deen in their private lives obviously they must have done dawa right but we don't see a large presence of islam at the time when the sahaba initially did hijra to abyssinia najashi believed later on the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent a letter inviting him to islam openly and he believed but it is said that he had to conceal his faith why because the the priests the the the, the bishops or or the people in authority they were not willing to give up their religion for something else so we see that the muslims they they lived over there for about 14 years However, they did not rebel against the government. They did not fight the government. Nothing like that. They just lived in peace, practicing Islam in their private lives. And then what happened? Many years later, 50, 60 years later, it was that Muslims conquered Abyssinia. And then Islam spread in Abyssinia. Any lesson we learned from this? Any lesson? Is it permissible to live in a non-Muslim country? or do we have to live in eternal guilt huh is it permissible when is it permissible when a person is able to practice their deen freely and alhamdulillah living over here we have that uh, we have that choice we have that freedom and we respect the freedom and we respect the government and the people for letting us live over here in peace and also practicing our deen right and we see a beautiful example in the in the muslims who immigrated to abyssinia that how they did not fight with the people they did not rebel against the government they didn't go with the intention of overthrowing the power the authority over there they went there in order to practice their religion in their private lives all right and they must have done dawa in their uh, regular interaction with the people but we don't see that a whole lot of people converted to islam at that point later on many years later when abyssinia was conquered then islam spread over there So a clearer map over here if you see uh this is a map of Saudi Arabia now on the left side you can see Makkah close to the Red Sea do you see it all right Makkah now above that you see Medina do you see it so uh and then on the left side of Makkah you see the Red Sea all right now cross the sea go down and what do you see Sudan and then Eritrea and then you see Ethiopia So you see that Ethiopia is here. So the Muslims what did they do? They went from Makkah to Jeddah. You see Jeddah? Jeddah is famous, right? Even if you want to go to Makkah, you take a flight to Jeddah. All right? So the Muslims also went to Jeddah from Jeddah. They sat on the ship and then with on the ship they came to where? Ethiopia. All right. Next image please. Now at that time, Ethiopia was the kingdom of Aksum. 
or axum. All right. And uh, if you see over here, it wasn't just uh, Ethiopia, but you see that at the bottom of Saudi Arabia, where uh, Yemen is, that area was also part of the Aksum kingdom. All right. And and Najashi was the king. Next image, please. This is also another image to make clear how uh, the Muslims immigrated to Abyssinia. Okay, let's continue our lesson. Now, many of the Muslims migrated to Abyssinia. They lived in peace over there. Back in Mecca, what was happening? Back in Mecca, the opposition, it continued. In fact, it, it intensified. Because if you think about it now, Abu Bakr anhu was also without protection. And assaults against the Prophet wasallam they only increased. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthened Islam. He strengthened the Muslims through many ways. We see that the mushrikun, they were extremely angry at losing 80 Muslims because they sent Amr bin al-As to Abyssinia, but he returned humiliated, embarrassed, empty-handed. So in that was a huge embarrassment for them, but also a big defeat. This was like a big failure. All right. This was like their first defeat against the Muslims. They weren't able to bring the Muslims back to Mecca. And it was also a huge embarrassment before the world. Because 80 of their people had left them and had gone to a different country and settled over there. So naturally their anger, it intensified against the Muslims who were in Mecca and therefore increased their persecution on the Muslims that remained in Mecca. And we see numerous incidents of this. So for instance, we learned that Utaybah bin Abi Lahab, he once came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said a few verses of the Qur'an. He said a few verses of the Qur'an and he said, I reject this, I disbelieve in it. And he attacked the Prophet ﷺ, he tore the shirt of the Prophet ﷺ and spat on his face. Then we see at another occasion, the Prophet ﷺ, he was performing the salah and when he was in sujood, Uqba bin Abi Mu'id, he stepped on his neck. And he trampled on the head of the Prophet ﷺ. And such incidents, they increased in their frequency. Now I want you to imagine, if the people were treating the Prophet ﷺ like this, right? who was not just a noble man, but he was also a Qurayshi of the Banu Hashim, the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, and the nephew of Abu Talib, and Abu Talib gave him his full support and protection, then what do you think about the rest of the Muslims? What do you think they were going through? Now we see that in the sixth year after of the darwa of the prophethood, at one occasion we see that Abu Jahl he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was very angry, frustrated, and he began verbally abusing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he went on for a long time, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was quiet, just listening, ignoring Abu Jahl. But Abu Jahl kept going, kept going, attacking the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam verbally, using very insulting words towards the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then eventually in his frustration he took a rock and he threw it on the Prophet ﷺ, which hit him on his head, wounded him, and his head was bleeding. Now, a woman was watching. It is said that that woman or those women were from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. They were from the Banu Hashim. And others say that it was just a slave woman, but she was watching. Now, she saw the whole incident and she was extremely angry that how could Abu Jahl treat Muhammad ﷺ like this? Because even if she did not believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the fact that someone from her family was attacked by Abu Jahl, that was not acceptable. So what happened in the evening when Hamza radiallahu anhu, who was Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, brother of Abu Talib, when he returned uh, from his hunting trip, this woman went to Hamza and she said, "What kind of an uncle are you? What kind of a leader are you? Your nephew is assaulted by Abu Jahl and you cannot even defend him." Stand up. This is not right. Stand up in his defense. So Hamza radiallahu anhu, what happened? He became very upset with Abu Jahl. Because you see, Abu Jahl, he was from a different family. All right? And remember I told you that there there was, you know, kind of competition between the Banu Hashim and Banu Makhzum. All right? Everything that Banu Hashim wanted to do, Banu Makhzum wanted to do. All right? So there was this tension between these two tribes. So Hamza he went to Abu Jahl. He struck him with his bow. And he said, how dare you attack my nephew? How dare you attack my nephew? And he said, and you know what? Even I follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Now, Hamza radiallahu anhu, why did he say this? That even I follow Muhammad, even I am a Muslim, even I am on his religion. He said this in defense of the Prophet wasallam. That basically, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? You cannot harm Muhammad wasallam, and you should not even dare to touch him. Because if you do, then realize who you're fighting with. You're fighting with me. Now, this was a big shock for everybody. That what? Hamza follows Muhammad wasallam. He's accepted Islam. It was a shock for people who were listening and it was also a shock for Hamza radiallahu anhu because it just came out. All right, These were words that he said without even thinking about them. But what happened? A fight broke out between the Banu Makhzum and, and Banu Hashim. And that fight eventually was you know, stopped because Abu Jahl, he said, leave Hamza, uh, it was my fault. I should not have attacked his nephew. Now what happened? Hamza went home and he's thinking, what did I just say? I said openly that I am a Muslim, whereas I'm not a Muslim. Now, Arabs, they valued Sidq a lot. All right? Truthfulness was a big value amongst them. Lying was something that did not befit a, a nobleman. And breaking your promise, going back on your word, was also something not acceptable. So now Hamza is stuck. If he goes back on his word, you know, he's humiliating himself. And at the same time, for him to accept Islam and be a Muslim was something he didn't want to do or, or he, di- he didn't think about it. So he was in, in confusion uh, and he made dua to Allah that, oh Allah, if this is the truth, then let me be firm on it. And if it's false, then just take it away from me. Now, the next day, Hamza radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and told him what had happened. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had no idea, imagine. So what happened? The Prophet ﷺ, he spoke to him about Islam. And Alhamdulillah, Hamza was convinced and he accepted Islam with his heart now. Before he accepted Islam with his tongue. And now he accepted Islam with his heart. What's the lesson we learn from this incident? Yes, Allah guides whom he wills. What else do we learn? Yes. Okay. That uh, accepting Islam with the tongue uh, is not enough. A person must also accept with their heart. All right. What else do we learn? Yes. Again, how Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala protected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, protected the Muslims, protected his religion through who? A non-Muslim. Hamza radhiAllahu Anhu was not a Muslim at that time. All right. But how Allah defended his messenger with him. Also, we see that Hamza radhiAllahu Anhu he said good words, right? What were those good words? That even I am on the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did he actually feel like that in his heart? No, he didn't. But he said something good anyway. Right? Now sometimes what happens is that we keep waiting. That when I feel respect for this individual, then I will show respect to them. Right? When I really want to pray, then I will pray. When I really feel gratitude for, you know, what the people are doing, then I will say thank you to them. When I really feel sorry, then I will say sorry. Right? But what do we learn from this incident? Say something good, even if you don't mean it. Even if you don't mean it. Do what is right, even if you don't want to. Let your tongue precede your heart. Alright? Let it happen. Because sometimes it goes the other way. The heart is willing and so the tongue follows. But sometimes the heart is not willing. So why should you hold your tongue back? Why should you hold your hands back from doing what is right? Do it anyway. And then what will happen? Insha'Allah, Allah will bless you with goodness. Like it happened with Hamza radiallahu anhu. He said something good and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted him with the gift of iman in his heart. Now we see that the Hamza radiallahu anhu, he was the senior most Qurayshi to convert. Because who was he? The son of Abdul Muttalib. So he was the senior most Qurayshi to accept Islam. So what happened? The Mushrikun, uh, the Quraysh, obviously they had to tone down their hatred, their enmity, their opposition against the Prophet ﷺ. Right? Because now they were not just attacking Muhammad ﷺ, they were picking a fight with Hamza. And Hamza was one of them. He was, he was of the most noble man. So obviously they had to tone down their opposition. Now we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he made dua. He said, Oh Allah, bring glory to Islam with one of these two men who is more beloved to you. Either Abu Jahl or Umar ibn al-Khattab. You see this dua? What is the Prophet ﷺ asking for? That either guide Abu Jahl to Islam or guide 
Umar radiallahu anhu to Islam. And both of these men, were they neutral when it came to Islam? No, they weren't. They were clearly on the side of opposition. Abu Jahl at the forefront. And Umar radiallahu anhu was also, uh, you know, for instance, we learned that his slave woman, she accepted Islam and he, he tortured her. He persecuted her. Forced her to leave Islam, but she didn't give up. Umar radiallahu anhu was one of those people who stopped people from the way of Allah. But look at the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh Allah, guide one of these people. Any lesson to learn from this? What is that? Don't underestimate the power of dua. And also, you know, ask for what you need, even if it sounds crazy and impossible. Ask. Ask anyway. Because who has the treasures? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can change hearts? Allah. So anything you need, ask Him, even if it seems impossible and far from reality. So the Prophet ﷺ made this dua, and one day what happened? Umar radiallahu anhu, remember that he was also from the elite of Makkah. One night, it is said that he went out to have a drink, alright, alcohol. But when he went to the place where his friends would usually gather, he found that that place was empty, nobody was there, even the wine cellar was not there. So basically the pub was closed, alright? Now what happened? And when a person is craving alcohol, they want it bad. And if they cannot have it, they have to distract themselves. So Umar radiallahu anhu had to distract himself. What did he do? He said, you know what? Let me go do tawaf. So he went to the Kaaba to do tawaf. Isn't it amazing? Beautiful. I mean, out of all things that he chose was tawaf. Now it's night time. Everybody's at home. Nobody should be at the Kaaba. So he went there to do tawaf. Now as he is doing tawaf, he sees that the Prophet ﷺ is performing salah. And the Prophet ﷺ is reciting Qur'an, you know, in, in a soft, beautiful voice. And Umar radiallahu anhu thought to himself, you know what, this is my chance. This is my chance. Nobody's here. And if I attack Muhammad ﷺ right here, nobody's going to know who did it. You know, I'll just finish this matter off. So, he drew close to the Prophet ﷺ and he could hear the Prophet ﷺ reciting the Qur'an. Umar anhu, it was as if the, for the first time ever he listened to the Qur'an. And when he listened to the Qur'an, he was affected by its recitation. The Prophet ﷺ was reciting Surah al And Umar, he thought to himself, what is this Qur'an? Where is this coming from? What is the source of this? And the Prophet ﷺ recited, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ This is the word of a noble messenger. Umar thought to himself, Yeah, he's, he's a good poet. وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ This is not the word of a poet. Little is it that you believe. Umar who thought to himself, He must be a soothsayer. He can read my mind. Huh? He knows what I'm thinking. وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنْ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ This is not the word of a soothsayer. Little it is that you, remember, you take heed. Umar anhu was even more surprised. And what is this? تَنْزِيلٌ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ This is a revelation from the Lord of the worlds. But what if he's inventing it? وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ And if he invented any statement about us, then what would happen? The verses continue that if Muhammad ﷺ fabricated any part of the Qur'an, then he would be severely punished. So anyway, Umar anhu was deeply affected by this, and he changed his mind. He didn't touch the Prophet ﷺ, he went back. He went away. Now what happened? Again, after some time, Umar anhu he was angry with the Prophet ﷺ. He was angry with the Muslims. He just wanted to finish the matter of the Prophet ﷺ off completely. And what happened? That Abu Jahl, he gave an incentive. He said, if anyone dares to kill Muhammad ﷺ, I'll give him this much silver, a whole lot of silver. So Umar who was tempted that, look, there is some gift also. Right? So he goes out of his house, you know, in anger with the intention to kill the Prophet ﷺ. And we see the nature of Umar who What was it like? Confident? Brave? Right? And he was like a problem solver. Right? Because for him, the biggest problem was exactly the matter of Islam. That was the biggest problem. So instead of being upset about it, what did he want to do? Just solve it. Finish it. So as he's going with his sword, a man saw him 
and that man was a Muslim and he sensed some trouble. So he asked him, where are you headed to? What are you up to? He said, you know what? I've had enough of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm just going to go and finish him off. So he tried to distract him that why would you do that and so on and so forth. But Umar radiallahu anhu, he said that, what, have you lost your religion also? Have you been affected by the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also? And that sahabi, he said, well, you know what? Before you worry about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why don't you go worry about your own family? He said, what do you mean? He said, your sister has become Muslim. Now, you see over here how the sahabi is putting the sister of Umar radiallahu anhu in danger? Hmm? Why? To protect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Because you choose lesser of the two evils. So anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu in his anger, he goes to his sister's house and when he reaches there, what happens? He sees that his, his sister and her husband both are sitting at home and before Umar radiallahu anhu came, Khabbab radiallahu anhu, he was uh, teaching them uh, Surah Taha from a scroll, from a mushaf. Alright? But when they heard Umar radiallahu anhu coming, Khabbab radiallahu anhu, he hid and the sister Fatima, she hid the Mus'haf. She covered the Mus'haf so that Umar radiallahu anhu would not see it. Any lesson we learn over here before we continue with the story? Who's teaching Fatima radiallahu anha and her husband? The Qur'an. Khabbab radiallahu anhu. Right? What do we learn from this? Yes, that even though it is difficult, still continue to learn. Right? Because we see that they had to learn Qur'an in, 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 in secret, in hiding. Right? They had to conceal this matter from their family, from the public. In, in the privacy of their home, they are learning, they're having a Quran lesson. Right? And also we see that Fatima and her husband had recently converted to Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ must have assigned Khabab anhu to teach them the Quran. So we see that when a person uh, accepts Islam, then one of the first things they must learn is, what? After salah and the basic things, what else must they learn? The Qur'an, its recitation, its words, its meanings. This is one of the first things that a person must learn about. And we see that Fatima and her husband are both learning from Khabbab radiallahu anhu. So if a woman has to learn the deen from a man, that is fine. There is no harm in that as long as the proper etiquette is observed. Anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu, he confronted them angrily. And he said, what is it that I heard just now? And they tried to change the topic, but it didn't happen. Umar radiallahu anhu in his anger, he tried to strike, he tried to punch his brother-in-law, but Fatima, she came in the middle to protect her husband, and the punch instead landed on Fatima who fell, and she was bleeding, and both Fatima and her husband, they became angry with Umar, and they said, so what if we have accepted Islam? So what if we are upon the truth? What if what you are upon is indeed false? So that kind of softened the heart of Umar radiallahu anhu because he had just attacked his sister. And for a man to attack his sister was something not acceptable. And she was bleeding. And both of them were defending themselves. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he calmed down and he requested to, 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 fi- to find out about what they were reading. But Fatima said that you are unclean. Before you even touch the Mus'haf, you have to clean yourself. Hmm? Now, why did she do this? First of all, to ensure that Umar anhu would be clean, his body would be clean. And secondly, also remember that washing yourself, you know, calms you down even more. Right? It calms you down even more. And then having a break in the middle. Alright? That from that fight, if they would, you know, move to the Qur'an, you know, reading the Qur'an, it would be too sudden of a transition, right? But with a break in the middle, that he gets to wash up, freshen up, calm down, right? And then look at the Qur'an, it would be better. So anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu, when he saw, because Umar radiallahu anhu was one of those people who could read and write, when he saw the Mus'haf, it was the verses of Surah Taha, the beginning verses. And when he read them, he, were, he was deeply affected. And so what happened? He went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Darul Arqam with Khabbab, and Umar radiallahu anhu embraced Islam. And when he embraced Islam, the Muslims were overjoyed. It is said that they said the kabir so loudly that it could be heard outside. Now, Umar radiallahu anhu, he was not a man who was scared. He was not a coward. If he believed that something was right, 
he was confident about it. And he would publicize it. So Umar radiallahu anhu publicized his faith. How? He went to Abu Jahl, knocked on his door. Abu Jahl opened the door. Ahlan wa sahlan. What brings you here? Umar said, I came to personally inform you that I have accepted Islam. And Abu Jahl, he was so offended, so angry, he cursed Umar radiallahu anhu, slammed his door on him, and basically sent him away. Now Umar radiallahu anhu went to this man, who was, you can say, the town crier, Right, the, the biggest gossiper or, or the person who could never keep any information to himself. You can say media of that time. So this man, Jamil, Umar radiallahu anhu went to him and he said, I have a secret to tell you, secret to tell you. I am a Muslim. Now Jamil, he gets up instantly and he screams out that Umar has become a sabi, meaning he has abandoned his religion. Umar radiallahu anhu said, no, he's lying. I have become a Muslim. I have not abandoned all religion. I have accepted Islam. So anyway, this man went around the streets of Mecca screaming out and publicizing that Umar anhu had accepted Islam. Now what happened? Some people, they got furious and they came and attacked Umar anhu. Umar anhu was not just going to get beaten up. He beat them back. He fought them. And so he fought them so much, one after the other, that it was almost evening time. All day this was happening. Anyone who dared to come and attack Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu gave it back to them. And then it is said that uh, the, the situation got so worse that many people gathered to attack Umar radiallahu anhu. And you can imagine a whole gang, a huge group of people. Until eventually one of the noblemen of Quraysh, he came in and he said to the people that leave him, Umar has my protection, nobody dare touch him. Anyway, Umar radiallahu anhu, as he was bold, confident, he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, are we not upon the truth? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, of course we are upon the truth. He said, then why are we praying in secret? Why can we not perform our prayer openly? So the Prophet ﷺ said, go ahead. So Umar anhu, Hamza anhu, both of them, they went to the haram and with them were 40 other Muslims. Together they went and performed salah. Out in the open. And everybody's just staring in shock. What is happening over here? You see, gradually the Quraysh were losing their control, their hold. Right? Ibn Abbas anhu, one day he asked Umar anhu many years later, that how did you get the title of Al-Faruq? Because he was Umar, Al-Faruq. Umar anhu said that the Prophet ﷺ gave me this title because when I converted, we marched to the Kaaba on that day for the very first time, headed by two rows. Me and Hamza. And for the first time ever, we prayed in public. Forty Muslims prayed in public. So the Prophet ﷺ gave me this title, Farooq. What does Farooq mean? One who distinguishes, separates from Faraqa, right? Between truth and falsehood. So he came out with the truth openly, right? He didn't hide it. When Umar anhu was dying, when he was on his deathbed, Ibn Mas'ud said that we have ever remained on Izza since Umar converted to Islam. That since Umar converted to Islam, we, we have been with Izza. We have been with honor. We have been honorable. Since Umar radiallahu anhu converted. Now with this, the mushrikun, they felt utterly disgraced. Right? They felt like they were failing and they felt like they were being disgraced because 80 Muslims were in Abyssinia. Alright? Hamza accepts Islam. Umar accepts Islam, and now 40 Muslims have the confidence to march to the Kaaba and perform salah out in the open. So all their attempts to stop Islam, to stop Muslims, were failing. The Prophet ﷺ was not affected by the mockery. He was not phased by any of the uh, attacks on him. The Muslims were unaffected by persecution. So the mushrikun were getting more and more angry. So... They increased in their persecution of the, of, uh, of the Prophet ﷺ of the Muslims and also they made numerous attempts to persuade Abu Talib to give up his protection of Muhammad ﷺ. Remember this happened at the beginning and now it happened again. So the leaders of Quraysh, they also went one by one to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. One of them, Utbah, he said, you know what, let me go talk to Muhammad ﷺ. He went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, look my son, if you need wealth, We'll give it to you. If you want some position of authority, some leadership, we'll give it to you. If you want to be king, we'll make you our king. And remember, there was no concept of a king in Arabia. 
right? It was all independent tribes and each tribe was led by its chiefs. There was no one king. And the reason was that the Arabs were too arrogant to accept the authority of just one man. Alright? So anyway, they said, he said, if you want to be king, you know what? We'll make you king. We'll accept you as our leader. If you want to get married to some woman, tell us who it is. We'll get you married. If you're suffering from some sickness, we'll get the best doctors. What is it that you want? We'll give it to you. But please, stop this Islam. Stop this prophethood. We don't want this anymore. We've had enough of this. The Prophet ﷺ said to Utbah, are you done? Utbah said, yes. He said, okay, now listen to me. So the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Fussilat. He began, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Hamim, Tanzilum min ar Rahmanir Rahim, Hamim. This is a revelation from the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. A book whose verses have been detailed, an Arabic Quran for a people who know, as a giver of good tidings and a warner, but most of them turn away so they do not hear. And they say our hearts are within coverings from that to which you invite us, and in our ears is deafness, and between us and you is a partition. So work, indeed we are working. Say, I am only a man like you, to whom it has been revealed that your God is but one God. So take a straight course to him and seek his forgiveness. And woe to those who associate others with Allah, those who do not give zakah, and in the hereafter they are disbelievers. Indeed, those who believe and do righteous deeds for them is a reward uninterrupted. Say, do you indeed disbelieve in he who created the earth in two days and attribute to him equals? That is the Lord of the worlds. And he placed on the earth firmly set mountains over its surface, and he blessed it and determined therein its its creature sustenance in four days without distinction for the information of those who ask. Then he directed himself to the heaven while it was smoke and said to it and to the earth, Come, willingly or by compulsion. They said, we have come willingly. And he completed them as seven heavens within two days and inspired in each heaven its command. And we adorned the nearest heaven with lamps and as protection. That is the determination of the exalted in might, the knowing. فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا فَقُلْ أَنْذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودِ But if they turn away, then say, I have warned you of a thunderbolt, like the thunderbolt that struck Ad and Samud. Utbah put his hand on the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ. To just stop here. Because he was deeply affected by the recitation of the Qur'an, by these verses. And when the Prophet ﷺ recited ayat about punishment, Utbah was scared. He was actually scared. That if you continue, perhaps we will be punished immediately. So stop right now. Utbah, he went back to his people. His face was changed. And they said, well, he's done his magic on you also. And Utbah tried to convince his people that look, leave Muhammad sallallahu alone. There's no point in opposing him. Because what he has brought, it is definitely going to bring something. It is definitely going to change something. The message that he has brought is not ordinary. The kalam that he speaks is not the kalam of a human being. So you leave him alone. If you oppose him, you will be defeated. And if you let him be, and he is victorious, then in that will be your victory. So the leaders of the Quraysh, they said, you know what? You've been affected by his magic. Utbah said, I've told you what I think is best. Now do what you please. Anyway, one by one, they tried to stop the Prophet ﷺ. In return, the Prophet ﷺ just did da'wah to them. Any lesson we learn over here? From the way of the Prophet ﷺ? Yes? Yes, I mean, look at the power of the Qur'an. Ja'far anhu recited Surah Maryam, and Najashi was affected. The Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Al-Haqqah, Umar anhu changed his mind. Alright? And now over here, Utbah also, he changed his mind. Utbah didn't become, become a Muslim. He didn't accept Islam. But he at least understood that there's no point in opposing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So the lesson we learn from this is always, always go back to the message, the Qur'an. Focus on the message. You see, when Utbah brought his offer to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa instead of having any discussion, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went straight to the message. Right? Straight to the message, the Qur'an. Now, sixth year of prophethood, what happened? The mushrikun, obviously their frustration was growing, and they decided that they had to kill the Prophet ﷺ. 
And they said that we will offer any blood money to do this. You know, we want to get rid of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at all costs. So they ganged up against Abu Talib and they demanded that either he should hand over Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to them or what will happen? They will cut off their ties with Abu Talib and disown him. You understand? They said, either you give us Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and accept blood money in return. We'll have him killed. We won't kill him ourselves. We'll, ha- we'll get the job done, but we'll give you the blood money, whatever you ask for. Whatever you ask for, we'll give it to you. You give Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to us. And if you don't accept this, then you know what? We don't know you and you don't know us. We are going to cut off all ties, all social ties with you. Abu Talib was infuriated and he said, do as you please, I will never hand him over to you. So what happened? The leaders of Quraysh, Abu Jahl, especially among them, they decided amongst themselves that they were now going to boycott the family of Abu Talib, the Banu Hashim. They were going to completely boycott them, which meant that they were not going to socialize with them. So no visiting them, no having them over as visits, no talking to them on friendly terms. All right. Likewise, no marriages, you know, with with their family, not at all. No business, no buying and selling, no friendly terms, nothing whatsoever. And this is known as the boycott, right? So what happened? Abu Talib, he decided to move away from Mecca. He said, fine, you don't want to deal with us. You you, you don't want to uh, interact with us. We don't need you either. And we will leave you. You leave us, we will leave you. So Abu Talib, he left Mecca with his family, Banu Hashim, and they moved outside Mecca in one of the valleys. All right? And it's known as Sherb Abi Talib. All right? And remember, over here, it wasn't just the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Talib and their close family members. It was the, the entire Banu Hashim. It was the entire Banu Hashim. Which means that there were Muslims amongst them as well as non-Muslims. Yes, Muslims and non-Muslims. We think that the boycott was only with the Muslims. No, it was with the family of Abu Talib. Alright? And there were other Muslims also who joined them. They left Mecca and they went and settled with Abu Talib and his family in Sherib Abu Talib. And there were some people from Banu Hashim that did not go. Like for example, Abu Lahab, he was a brother of, of uh, Abu Talib, but he did not go because he sided with the Quraysh, with the Mushrikun, right? And they wrote this up in a doc in in a document. Who the Quraysh? This boycott. It was like a treaty they made. They wrote it up. They signed it. It was a written agreement, and this written agreement they kept it in the Kaaba. So you understand? It wasn't just political, but it was also Religious in a way. They they tied it with deen. They put it inside the Kaaba. So that it would be considered sacred. Nobody would violate it. So what happened? For the next two to three years, the Banu Hashim and the Muslims who joined them lived in extreme difficulty and hardship. Why? Because first of all, they were far from the city. Right? And secondly, no business with them. So if they wanted food, where would they buy it from? Nobody in Mecca would sell food to them. Nobody. At all. They couldn't even get water. They couldn't get any food. And the outsiders who came, the visitors who came, <coughs> Abu Jahl and the other leaders of Quraysh, they would give them more money. They would say, if, if Banu Hashim buys this from you for five dollars, we'll give you ten dollars. Alright? So what happened? Obviously the, the visitors also, whose deal would they take? Of the Quraysh. And this was one of the most difficult times that the Prophet ﷺ went through. In a hadith we learned, the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, I have feared for the sake of Allah such that no one has feared. And I have been harmed for the sake of Allah such that no one has been harmed. Thirty days and nights have passed over me. And I and Bilal had nothing that one with a liver could eat. One with a liver meaning a living being. We had nothing that a living being could eat. Meaning we had nothing that you could call food. Except for something so small that Bilal could conceal it under his armpit. Meaning for 30 days, the food that we got was just so little 
that which you would call food. It was so little that Bilal could literally keep it in his armpit. He could hide it in his armpit. That small it was. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, despite this hunger and this abandonment and this difficulty, he still did da'wah. He took advantage of this time. He increased his da'wah amongst the travelers and the visitors, people who came for Hajj and Umrah. Because you see, in Mecca, if the Prophet ﷺ wanted to speak to anybody, usually what would happen? The Quraysh of Mecca, they would come and interfere. Right? Send the visitors away. Distract them. Now, the Prophet ﷺ was not in Mecca. He was outside. It wasn't a busy place. So before even the caravans could reach inside Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ would go and speak to them and do da'wah to them. Any lesson to learn from this? Okay. إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ yusra Definitely. And what else? Exactly. The mission did not stop just because the Prophet ﷺ was in hardship. You know, there is no period in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where we find him waiting for things to change. Waiting for things to go back to normal. Never. If things were beyond his control in one way, he took advantage of what was in his control. What he could do. If he couldn't do one thing, he focused his efforts on others. And this is something that we need to learn also. Because many times we have our mind fixed on a particular, you know, focus, action, uh, whatever it may be. We want to do it, we only want to do that. And if we're not able to do it, we'll just wait for things to change, and then we will do something. Well, the fact is that change is something permanent in life, Right? Things are always going to be changing. They will never be the same. So you have to do what you have to do now. You know, for instance, if you keep saying, well, it's winter, I can't exactly do anything fun, so I just need to wait for the winter to be over. Then six months of the year, you're sitting idle. Right? Six months of the year, gone. It just hit me the other day because every day I would tell myself, it's too cold, I can't take the kids outside. You know, inshallah, in a few weeks when the weather is better, I'll take the kids outside. And then I'm like, but this is not fair. Six months of the year, kids will be inside? That's not good. You know what? Cold, hot, snow, whatever. Alhamdulillah, we have been blessed with weather apps that tell us what the weather is like, what the exact temperature is. Put your stuff on and go. Right? If you keep waiting for the weather to change, you're not going to get anything done. And this is what we see in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Just because he couldn't be in Mecca, okay, we can't be in Mecca. Now we're outside Mecca, let's do what we can over here. Don't waste your time waiting. Never waste your time waiting. You know, sometimes we wait. Yeah, when I'm, when I'm married, then I'll do this. Yeah, you know what? When, when this course is over, then inshallah I'll do this. When it's Friday night, then I'll do it. Right? Let the March break come, then I'll do something. March break came and went. Khalas. So whether you're busy or you're free, whether you have 50 things to do or zero things to do, what you have to do, make time for it and do it. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has changed your situation for now, it's for a reason. Learn to work in this situation. Now what happened? Two to three years went by and these were extremely difficult years. And we see that there were times when the people had no food, no water, and they would drink collected rain water. And they would eat leaves, leaves, imagine, no food. They would eat leather, anything they could find, they would eat it, even dead animals. Whatever they found, they would eat it just to survive. Now this was a very uh, pitiful state, and we see that there were people among the Quraysh who were sympathetic towards the Muslims, because after all, they were somehow or the other related. If they were not directly Banu Hashim, they were somehow related. So for example, nephew of Khadija radiallahu anha, some other relatives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were sympathizers. First of all, we see that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to remove this difficulty from them. And then we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also sent sympathizers. There were five noblemen in particular, five ashraf from the Quraysh, Hisham bin Amr, one of them, who initiated this conversation. He went to Zuhair, Mut'im bin, uh, bin Adi, Abdul Bukhtari bin Hisham, Zam'a bin Aswad, and he reminded them of their ties of kinship with the Banu Hashim. 
And he said, come on, they're your relatives. Is it right that we are eating and drinking and our relatives are dying in hunger and thirst? Does it make sense? And we see that these people, uh, there were times when they would secretly send food supplies to the Muslims, to the Banu Hashim in the Sharab Abi Talib. Secretly they would send aid to them, but they couldn't do it publicly. But they had had enough of seeing that miserable state of Banu Hashim. So Hisham, he, he, he reproached them of their kinship and reproached them for the suffering of their relatives. So together they made a plan. That you know what, we have to end this treaty. We have to destroy it. So what happened? The following day, when the Quraysh were sitting in their gathering, uh, in their nadi, uh, near the Kaaba, Zuhair, he came and he said, Shall we eat and drink while the Banu Hashim die of hunger? Double standards? This is not right. They are, they are our people. They are our relatives. How is it fair that we are eating, drinking, and they're dying of hunger? For how long will we starve our own kin to death? This is something evil. Now Abu Jahl, he said, no, but this is a treaty. We have decided. We have agreed on this. So what happened? Somebody else got up. And who was that? Zamra. He got up and he said, you know what, Abu Jahl, you're wrong. We never agreed to this. Abu Jahl said, we agreed to this. Abu Bukhtari got up. He said, Zamra is right. Zamra is right. That we didn't agree on this. Abu Jahl again defended himself. And uh, another of those five men, he got up. So what happened? One after the other, all these five men, they got up and they expressed their, you know, opposition to the treaty. They said that they didn't agree with it. And they said that it was not fair. It, it was tyranny. It was ulm. It seemed as though Abu Jahl or the treaty was losing its support. Right? And now something had to be done. And, and Zuhair, he kept saying that we have to destroy this treaty. We have to destroy this treaty. This is not fair. This is ulm. So it seemed like the public support had shifted against Abu Jahl. And this was a whole plan that these five men had made. Okay, from before. Now what happened? The Prophet ﷺ, he went to, to Abu Talib one day and he said that my Lord has informed me that the treaty that the Quraysh had written, it's kept in the Kaaba, that treaty has been eaten up by termites. And only the words, Bismik Allahumma, remain. Abu Talib said, has your Lord informed you of this? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, my Lord has informed me of this. So Abu Talib, he went to the Quraysh and he said, you know what, let's end all of this. All right? Now, why don't you bring the treaty out so that we can come to some agreement? The Quraysh thought, well, Abu Talib, he's, you know, he wants to hand over Muhammad ﷺ to us. They were really happy. So they happily went, brought the treaty out. Before they opened it up, before they opened up the, the box or the case in which the treaty was, Abu Talib said, my nephew has told me that his Lord has informed him that the treaty, the parchment has been consumed, it has been destroyed by termites, and only the words Bismik Allahumma remain. If this is not the case, if my nephew is lying, then you know what? Take my nephew. But if he is true, if he is right, then you know what? We're ending this treaty. The people thought, of course. How would Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know? Because this treaty was in a case, secured, inside the Kaaba. Kaaba is locked. Banu Hashim are living outside of Makkah. They don't even get to come to the Kaaba. Of course. You know what? We have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Happily, they open it up. And when they see, yes, the parchment was completely destroyed. And only the words, Bismik Allahumma remained. So what happened now? The treaty was dissolved and alhamdulillah, the Banu Hashim were now allowed to come back into Makkah. And this boycott was over. And this was a miracle. Right? This was further proof of the truthfulness of the Prophet wasallam. However, we see that still many people, they did not embrace Islam. But there is a, a deep lesson for us to learn in this. We see that the Banu Hashim, they went on this boycott, this self-imposed exile, right, with the Prophet and with the Muslims. What united them? Was it their religion? Was it their religion? No. Clearly, they were on different religions. Abu Talib was a mushrik. Many of his relatives were mushrik. Muhammad was a Muslim. He was inviting people to Islam. They were not on the same religion. Then what is it that united them? It was their blood. Right? It was their kinship. 
So what does this teach us? That as Muslims, can we join hands with other non-Muslims for good causes? Can we? Can we lend them our support? Can we be with them? Can we take their support for uh, for a benefit that 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 is for everybody, or 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 for a, a matter that concerns the whole community? Can we be with them? Yes, we can be. Because sometimes we wonder, can we can we join hands with the with the Christians or the Jews or the atheists or even uh, you know other people? Can we uh, join hands with them for a cause that concerns the whole community? So, for example, something to do with education or something to do with uh, some government policy. Can we do that? Or do we have to say, no, 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 non-Muslims, I have nothing to do with them? No. If they are your countrymen, then remember there are certain matters that affect the entire community. And we see evidence in the life of the Prophet ﷺ where people came together in times of hardship and also in times of joy. Why? Because the matter concerned everybody. Now what happened? The Muslims returned to Makkah. However, because of the hardships that the Banu Hashim had endured in Sherb Abi Talib for those three years, we see that the health of many people had severely deteriorated. And Abu Talib was one of them. So what happened? The year, the end of the boycott that occurred in the 10th year of the da'wah, of the prophethood. And we see that this year also became the year of huzn, of sorrow. Because the Prophet ﷺ endured sorrow upon sorrow. What kind of sorrow? First of all, the death of Abu Talib. In Shawwal, Abu Talib became severely ill. The Quraysh went to him with a proposal that, you know what, tell your nephew to keep silent. Abu Talib also wanted that after he dies, the Prophet ﷺ would have some kind of security. So he tried to convince the Prophet ﷺ to, to give up again. The Prophet ﷺ refused and he said, I offer you one thing which if you follow, you will become the leaders of this land, of the Arabs, and the non-Arabs will give jizya to you. So the Quraysh were like, you know what, not one thing, we were ready to accept ten things from you. So the Prophet ﷺ said, say, la ilaha illallah. They said, no way. No way, not at all. Now Abu Talib, he became extremely sick. He was at his deathbed, literally, about to die. And Abu Jahl and other mushrikun, they came to ensure that Abu Talib would not accept Islam. The Prophet ﷺ kept saying to him, say, la ilaha illallah. And Abu Jahl would say, are you going to leave the religion of Abdul Muttalib? The Prophet ﷺ again requested, say la ilaha illallah, so I can at least make dua for you, I can at least request that you may be forgiven. But Abu Talib, the last words that he said was, on the religion of Abdul Muttalib. He wasn't willing to give up his religion. Now this was something very, very painful for Rasulullah And First of all, the death of Abu Talib was painful. But then secondly, the fact that Abu Talib died as a non-Muslim, that was even more difficult. Even more hard for the Prophet ﷺ to take. Which is why we see that in a hadith, we learn, which is in as silsilat al-Sahihah, that when Abu Talib died, Ali anhu came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, that your am, your uncle, a shaykh who, the, the old man, Abdal, the one who was astray, Qadmata, he has died. Who will bury him? Who will bury him? The Prophet ﷺ told Ali, Idhab, go and bury your father. Ali radhiallahu anhu said, no, I will not bury him. Innahu mata mushrikan. He died as a mushrik. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, go and bury him. And then don't talk to anybody until you come to me. So Ali radhiallahu anhu, he said that I went and I buried Abu Talib. And when I returned to the Prophet ﷺ, I had dust and mud on me. The Prophet ﷺ told me to freshen up, take a bath. I did it. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for me. So much dua that pleased me. So much that I wouldn't exchange that for anything of this world. We see that the death of Abu Talib was extremely difficult, not just for the Prophet ﷺ, but even Ali anhu and other people, because Abu Talib died as a mushrik. This was a very big loss. Very big loss. But there is hikmah in this. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this to happen? And inshallah we will discuss that. that why Allah allowed that Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, remains a mushrik, dies a mushrik, but yet he is one of the biggest supporters.
What's the hikmah in this? This huzn was followed by another huzn, which was the death of Khadija radiallahu anha. So inshallah, the details of Amul huzn, the year of sorrow, we will discuss that in our next lesson. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.